Hi there. In this video, we're going to be looking at cost effectiveness analysis, or in particular, how do we combine costs and benefits to help decision makers? We do cost effectiveness analyses to decide whether it's worth spending money on a new intervention. If we use a new intervention, it will displace an existing intervention for people with that disease. So that's one form of opportunity cost. And if it costs extra money, we'll also need to disinvest elsewhere to free up that money, and that's a second sort of opportunity cost. We need to look at relative costs and effects. Interventions aren't evaluated in isolation, they must be evaluated relative to an alternative. And we use a cost effectiveness threshold to deal with the opportunity cost of getting money from elsewhere. The incremental cost effectiveness ratio, called the ISA, is the ratio of the incremental costs and the incremental effectiveness. As shown here in the formula, it's the change in costs divided by the change in benefits. And assuming that a new intervention increases benefits and costs, a lower ISA is better because it means the intervention is more efficient. There's a concept called dominance. If option B is cheaper and generates more benefits than option A, we would have no reason to choose option A. B dominates A and A is dominated by B. No matter what our cost effectiveness threshold, we will always choose option B in this case. What about when we have more than two options? Here we've got three options, A, B and C, and they're plotted on a graph with their costs and benefits on the Y and X axes. In this case, we might think that B could be worth investing in, but if we think about a hypothetical blend of A and C, we could find one which dominates B. This hypothetical point, which I've shown here as A squiggle C, would dominate B, so we say that B is extendedly dominated by A and C. The cost efficiency frontier is the set of options which are neither dominated nor extendedly dominated, and we only calculate ISAs for options that are on the cost efficiency frontier. For each of those options we calculate its ISA relative to the next best option on the frontier in terms of benefits, or to the next cheapest option. So let's take a look at this example with five different options. First off, we can see that option E is dominated by option D because it's more expensive and it's less uh, effective in terms of qualities generated. Next, we would notice that B is extendedly dominated by A and C, and you can check that for yourself. That means that our cost efficiency frontier is A, C and D, we don't calculate incremental costs, qualities, or an ISA for A. We say that's the reference strategy. For option C, we calculate its incremental costs and incremental qualities versus A and conclude it has an ISA of $50,000 per quality. For option D, we now compare it to option C and we find that it has an incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $100,000 per quality. And this means that if our cost effectiveness threshold is less than £50,000 per quality, we should choose option A. Whereas if our cost effectiveness threshold is between £50,000 and $100,000 per quality, we should choose option C. And if our cost effectiveness threshold is over $100,000 per quality, we should choose option D. We've talked about the ISA, and here are some pros and cons. So you can calculate the ISA without knowing the cost effectiveness threshold, although it can be argued that it's not useful unless you know what that cost effectiveness threshold is. It also tells us something about the efficiency of an intervention. There are some downsides, however. It's a ratio measure which makes it difficult to analyse statistically. You end up with strange decision rules, such as having to choose the item with the highest ISA that is less than the cost effectiveness threshold. And a negative ISA can occur when an intervention is dominant or when an intervention is dominated, so very hard to interpret a negative ISA. So there's an alternative to the ISA which you might like to use, which is net monetary benefit. 
If we know what our threshold is, then we can rearrange our calculation. So instead of, as shown in the first equation here, calculating the ISA, which is the change in costs divided by the change in benefits, and asking is that less than the cost effectiveness threshold here shown as lambda, instead if we multiply both sides through by the change in benefits, assuming that that's positive, and then we move that change in costs over to the other side, we instead get this equation, which is asking is lambda times the change in benefits minus the change in costs greater than zero? And we call that quantity the incremental net monetary benefit. And so you'll see that when the incremental net monetary benefit is positive, that means that the ISA has to be less than the cost effectiveness threshold. So the decision rule has been rearranged from being in terms of the cost effectiveness threshold to being related to zero. If the incremental net monetary benefit, or INMB, is positive, then the intervention is cost effective. We can calculate the INMB from incremental costs and benefits, or if we want, from absolute net monetary benefits, as we see here in these equations. The change in benefits is just B1 take away B0. The change in cost is just C1 take away C0. We can then rearrange this to get this quantity here, take away this quantity here. Um, this quantity is just the net monetary benefit of intervention one, not taking into account the relative benefits or the relative costs. These are just absolute benefits and absolute costs. And here, the net monetary, net monetary benefit, the zero. So some pros and cons of net monetary benefit. The decision rule is now very simple. You just need to know which intervention has a positive incremental net monetary benefit, or if you have more than two options, which has the highest net monetary benefit. The distribution of the incremental net monetary benefit is often normal or close to normal, which helps for statistical purposes. Unfortunately, the net monetary benefit doesn't tell you if any of the options are dominated or extendedly dominated. And you do need to pre-specify lambda or present results across a range of lambda values. Your next steps then are going to be to learn about sensitivity analyses.